What up, squad? How you guys doing? How are you guys doing this weekend? Let me get some chat open. Hell yeah. Yo, what up? Oh, I see some I see some familiar names in here. What's up, sunscreen? What's up, gamma? How you guys doing? Hell yeah. Oh, we got retina. Hell yeah. What's up, guys? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna break down a few sessions. I'm super excited. Um, I got two sessions to break down with you guys today. We're gonna do the session for close to me, which is the one that I've got open here. It's probably one of my favorite sessions that I've done in the last while for sure. And then the second one we're gonna do is gonna be an unreleased track um, that will be forthcoming on Bitbird in the future. But I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a a taste of it before it comes out so i'm hyped hell yeah um at any point if you guys want to uh ask any questions about what we're doing in the production side of things just shoot them in the chat i've got the chat open so i'll be reading it um we can hop into any concept you guys want go a little bit deeper on whatever you guys uh have questions on and then at the very end we're going to do a little q a so um questions about i guess like not as production related things we'll hit all at the end there but we don't really have a time limit so as long as you guys got questions we're pretty good to go i got snacks and water so we should be chilling um for those of you that don't know me and are just fans of bitbird uh, i go by tails i've been making music for close to 10 years um in ableton so i've been using it for a super long time and uh yeah i'm super hyped to show you guys what I do and how I make tracks. Uh, we're going to try and focus things around like mixing, um, mixing and arranging, because I think that they go hand in hand. And if you can arrange in specific ways, it makes your job as a mixer a lot easier. So let's make sure you can see all this. Hell yeah. Yeah, I haven't done a session breakdown. I don't think I've ever done like a full session breakdown on Twitch. So I'm hyped. Yo, what up, Highwind? How you doing, my guy? Hell yeah. Um, let's just take a quick listen through the song, make sure that the session is working, which I, I maybe should have done earlier. But yeah, let's take a listen, see how it sounds. Make sure you guys can hear it, which you currently can't, but let's do this. We can fix this. We can fix this. There we go. Fire, and I turned this off because it was buzzing. <laughs> All right, so we're going to break this down. For the most part, that's what the track does. There's a second drop that's got some variations and a bit of a breakdown, but as we kind of break it down, we'll definitely hear all the different parts. So no no worries there. Um, generally, I start from the drums. I'm gonna mute the instruments because I use a lot of noisy plugins. So you can see right away, like my sessions all have this buzzing and hissing to them because of a few plugins that I use, but we'll turn those off for now just so you guys aren't hearing the static the whole time. Um, but yeah, let's kind of start with, um, some of the drop stuff and then we'll move into some of the kind of supplementary sections of the, the track. Um, for this track, I really kind of wanted to, to make it rhythm based. Um, a lot of my tracks in the past have been pretty flowy and, and more trappy. So this was the first thing that I ever did that was a little bit more like upbeat in the hats, um, and a little bit like faster through the hats. So yeah, I just wanted to break down a few of the layers that we've got going here. Um, hell yeah. 
Howdy, what up, 36 or 360 music? Um, but yeah, I wanted to break down a few of the layers. I've got a ton of kick layers here. Um, generally, when I'm making a track and get into the mixing process, I'll usually go through three or four different kicks. So I'll, I'll literally just duplicate my kick channel and try a few different main kick samples and swap through them and see which one fits with my mix the best. Um, from what I've found, there's no like perfect kick that works for me. Every single time I make a track, I pull in a few of the same ones and they never work. It always ends up being something different. So yeah, that's why there's three kicks here. These ones are all turned off, these top two, and this is just the main kick here, just one single sample, which I think is from like, I don't know where it's from. I think it's from maybe like an oversampled kit or something like that. It's been processed down a few times to make it a little bit more punchy, but this is the main kick as a whole. Um, I try not to do too, too much layering with my kick and snare. Um, I generally try and find stuff that's just more tailored to the sound I want. Just right out of the gate, find better samples instead of, uh, you know, having to layer a ton of stuff and do a ton of processing. But yeah, so that's the, the main kick that plays through the drops of the track. Um, yeah, instead of layering, I just go through a bunch of different options and just see what, what sounds good. So this was the OG kick or the top layer, I probably tried to EQ this out and layer it in, but took it out. And this was the main like body of the kick originally, but this single sample just worked way better, way, way more like attack and, and punch to it. The snares are super simple too. It's just a little UK or UGK rim shot layered with just a little bit of a body snare. So pretty much all my tracks will have a little snare underneath. If it's a, it's a little bit more like clappy or rim shot based, I usually always throw in just like a little tiny thing like that, just to get a little bit more body to the sound. So without it, we've got that. And then with it, we just get a little bit more roundness overall with the snare. Yo, what up, Blade? Hell yeah. Welcome in. Welcome in. Um, besides that, we've also... I use Decimore. You guys will see this a ton throughout the session. Um, Decimore is probably my go-to bit crusher slash downsampling plugin. Um, if you don't have it, it's like a rent-to-own plugin through Splice, and it's super cheap. But yeah, there's a ton of really dope presets, and they all do a, a really good job of just downsampling sounds, giving them a bit of grit. Um, so I usually use it like this. So this is without it. And then throwing the, the decimal on, you just get a little bit more of like a crunch and a little bit more of a distortion on top of it, which I love, but yeah. So that's just the main kick and snare, um, with a little bit of a lead in every second time the snare hits. Um, I usually, I think in this track have everything pretty gridded for the drums but I'm introducing a, a good amount of swing through the hats and through these little um, like roll-ins to the snare. They're all in, in slightly different places, um, forward and backward in time to just make it feel a little bit uh, more movement heavy on the snares. Just a little lead in. And then with the kick. But yeah, the, the other thing that I kind of like to point out with this track is I kept the drum pattern in terms of the kicks and snares very, very simple because there's a ton of shit going on with the synths and all the other percussions that make it busy. I had a busier kick pattern at the start and there was just too much with the, with the rhythm of the synths and the rhythm of the hi-hats, shit was just getting too um, busy and too confusing. So I recommend if you've got really plucky leads and really like rhythm based lead sections to keep your drums a little bit more simple. What up swirl music? What up? What up? Um, yeah, the, the top sections of this track were super simple. Um, just a few loops that I chopped up to, to fit the groove a little bit, but yeah, it starts with this noisy loop. 
super classic. There's just a ton of like house music loops um, from Splice. Well, this one is at least. And it's just chopped just to get a bit of a groove with the kick and snare. Um, and then everything else in this drum section for like the tops of the drops are literally only just to give it a little bit of flavor and a little bit of like grit and and atmosphere to them. Um, this one's just like an old Baltimore Breaks classic, like the Think Break or something like that. And it's just chopped up to just line up with this top um, like open hat loop. just gives us that cool kind of like extra rhythm to this hi-hat loop yo thanks for the sub yhr official prime gamer let's go let's go so we got those two layers um i generally i don't usually do this in sessions but i did push these ones off using the delay over here i don't know if you guys can see it if it's big enough but these are delayed like nine milliseconds and seven milliseconds. Just push back in time a little bit. So realistically, these are sitting more so like, you know, just over to the right a little bit in time. Uh, just to get a little bit of swing with uh, the kicks and snares. I find when all these sort of rhythms are too on the grid, um, they feel... Yeah, what up, Wayne Brando? How you doing, homie? Having these just pushed off the grid just a tiny bit, these top loops... Um, it makes the track feel a little bit more natural when everything's really gridded with tracks like this. It feels very, very like almost awkward with the rhythm. So I just experimented with a few different times here. And then this top loop is literally, I just resampled the whole track and high passed it once it was almost done just to get a little bit more like bite out of it. So this is just like a section of the track. That's been high passed and boosted a little bit just to sit in the, the groove a little bit more, make it a little bit more bright. That's pretty much the whole drum part. They're super simple. There's not a ton of processing on them. A little bit of filtering, a little bit of like light EQ. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of boosting in the highs. I generally, and I'm sure I'm sure some of you guys have the same problem make my music a little bit too uh, warm over time. Like I get rid of the highs because it just feels harsh in my headphones. So I have to consciously boost a lot of highs and get things feeling like, yeah, sizzly and bright. Um, we'll cover these fills and stuff as we kind of go. But this section is literally all just like my top fills and like random hits. So like little amen break fills, little like... Lucas, yeah, same. It, it feels weird to, to have a ton of highs, especially when you're listening in headphones. Like after an hour or two of listening to that, it feels like it all needs to be turned down all the time. Um, but I, I, I've got a few ways that I combat that and, and I'll show you what I mean. Um, but yeah, just little fills in this section just to accentuate the drum parts a little bit. Um, shout out Roman Silver. He used this break in the track we did forever uh, that came out a while ago. So I had that one in my arsenal ever since, and I love to, to chop it up. Thoughts on look ahead on compressor? Um, look ahead can be important. Um, it, it definitely hogs your CPU a little bit more. But if your computer can handle it, having a higher look ahead, really all it's going to do... Oh, damn, so many questions. Um a higher look ahead is just going to make your compression a little bit smoother. Um, without any look ahead, your compressors are reacting very, very quickly, um, which can give you some erratic behavior every once in a while. But if your CPU can handle it, a higher look ahead will just give you a smoother sound. Is mixing in monitors better than headphones? I mix every single thing I've ever done in headphones. Um, if you've got like a really nice room that's sound treated and you can trust it, then, then I think monitors are awesome. But I'm always kind of on the move in different places, so I've never ever had a good monitoring environment for headphones, or sorry, for speakers. 
Um, I've got speakers plugged in and I listen on them occasionally just for fun, but I've done every single track I've ever done with these headphones, the Sennheiser headphones. Um, but yeah, so those are the kind of drums in the track. There's not a ton going on with those. A little bit of processing. I generally like to um, get all of my drums, uh, my top drums, side chained to my kick and my snare. So a lot of people do just the just the kick. I like to do the snare too, um, because I like my snares to be really like stand out in the mix. If it sounds good on bad headphones. It'll sound good everywhere. Yeah, I use I use those and I use my like iPod headphones or like my Apple headphones. But yeah, a little bit of a EQ on the the whole kick group here to make it a little less boomy because there's a, a good amount of sub in this track. But this is the drums as a whole, so nothing too crazy. Oh damn! Okay, someone just asked like the best question ever. Which which. I'm stoked on because it's something I really want to talk about anyways. Um, I'll show you guys exactly how I get my low end to, to work for me um, pretty much all the time. Um, and it will tie into kind of what we're talking about. So for my kick and my snare and my sub, uh, this is like literally this is like my favorite mixing tip ever. If there's like any takeaway for this masterclass for me, like this would probably be it. Um, so you guys may have this problem and I did forever for years where you fall into something called circular mixing, which is like, you know, you turn up your, your sub and your kick and your snare, you start turning up your synths. And then all of a sudden, like, um, let's say your sub starts to feel too quiet because you've turned up your synths too much. So you go ahead and you turn down your synths and now your drums feel too loud compared to the synths. So you turn those all back down and you go in this big thing of like, now things feel too quiet. I'm going to turn them back up and you keep going in this big circle of mixing, um, which happens all the time. Like, Oh, it's too loud. Now it's too quiet. Now this is too loud. This is too quiet. Um, what I like to do at the very start of a track or at the start of the mixing process is set an anchor in my mix. And I do this in headphones all the time. So I'll solo my kick, my snare, and just my sub. So just those three elements. So this one here is my sub. Sounds like this. Let me turn this group on. So this is the sub for the track. This is the kick and snare. I'll put those both on too. And I'll go over to my master chain and open ozone and I'll set up just a relationship between those three elements. So I want my kick to generally be getting like, I don't know, two to five decibels of gain reduction on my master. So let me, let me take out the sub for a second. Um, where's the sub? So I could probably have pulled this down like a tiny bit more. to get a bit more game reduction on that kick. But essentially what I want to do when I'm in headphones, because I don't have a good sub or anything like that, I want to basically have my sub at the max volume that it can be at before it gets touched by my maximizer. So right now, it looks like my maximizer is pulling my kicks down to about here. Like, I wish I could pause this so we could look at this, but to about here is where I'm getting game reduction to on my kicks right around there. So I want to bring my sub in and basically have my sub at that exact volume um, where if my sub was any louder, it would start to be hit by my maximizer here. We can see if my sub was, yeah, like maybe a decibel or two louder, it would start to be hitting my maximizer. And that's, that's when you run into massive problems with your mix. Um, you never really want your sub to be getting touched by your maximizer here. Um, so that means it's going to be turning down all your synths, all your vocals, all your synth leads every time uh, the sub is played. So we want to avoid that. So I kind of keep my sub... Exactly, yeah. So I'll show you what I mean. So if my sub was here, see how it's touching now? Occasionally. 
That's too loud. I want it at the volume. Where would it be? Yeah, like right around here. The volume that it would just touch it if, if it was a little bit louder. So something around there is where I'm going to be having my sub. And then from there on out, those elements in the track don't change at all. The kick, the snare, and the sub will stay in that relationship the whole time. And they have for like every single Tails track I've ever made because I can never test them like, you know, on a big set of speakers or in the club or in nice monitors. So those three things will stay the same and then I'll mix everything around those. So my kick, my snare, my sub. I can change the tone of all those three things, but um, as long as when I'm conscious of like, if I change the tone, I should also be checking if I've changed the overall volume. Um, it, it, it stops you from doing this circular mix because if, if it sounds, so I guess I should explain this a bit better. Once you get those three things going and you start bringing in more elements, if those elements sound too loud or too quiet compared to the kick or snare, you know that those things um, need to change in volume, not your kick and snare and your sub. Those will always stay the same. It's basically what I'm trying to say. But I use that pretty much all the time. That's like the main thing I do with my mix. And that's why I'll put ozone or like any limiter you have really, any maximizer. I put this on my session pretty early. Um, like halfway through the beat, once I get started, I'll throw this on just so I have that reference. So I know my kick, snare, and sub are loud enough. Um, uh, I should also mention because you guys seem pretty hyped on that, which is good. I, I, I hope it helps. Um, this is just my sub. I've got all these different tonal bass layers in here too. And I'm not including those in, in the volume check. You know what I mean? Like that's just my sub. There's a bit of like overtone on this sub, but we'll get to it when we get to it. But yeah, yeah, my sub's a bit saturated. Yeah, it is. And two in this track, um, I'm not going to lie. We got two subs and one of them isn't filtered. And I was going to change it before the stream because I noticed it. But there's also this quiet sub that happens, which still has its low end in it, which is like usually like a faux pas. People are like one thing below 100 hertz and filter out everything else. Um, it just sounded nice to have this extra little bit of sub from a sample. Um, but yeah, let's hop into actually some of like the synths and stuff in here. Since we already covered the drums, um, which are very basic. That's kind of what I wanted to show or showcase with the drums is that they're super basic. There's no, no processing, no crazy like extras on the drum. It's just like, like, I guess good sample choice and like good volume choices like there's really not much on any of these a little bit of decimort for um like some bite and stuff a little bit of filtering but yeah my drums are very very dry and very bare there's no reverbs no delays nothing like that um so i think like a big thing that people ask a ton is about this this first initial sound this sound here which was kind of like the starting point of this track. And I apologize that you guys are going to hear this like buzzing sound. It's like built into this, this track a little bit, but yeah, this initial sound here is just a patch I made in massive. It's very, very basic. Feel free to like, you know, screenshot this or, or take a look at it. But in reality, it's just a square wave going through a low pass filter with a little bit of a like envelope on it and then a bit of tone coming from this phase knob right here. Um, besides that, it's, it's very, very simple. There's like a tiny, or I guess not a tiny bit, but we're slamming it through this tube, like teletube thing. So without it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's like that bass patch in a nutshell. To be honest, like this track was really inspired by Roman Silver type stuff. Um, and like, I know he's a massive stan, so I just like hopped in massive and was messing around with some sounds, 
but I think the main sort of sauce from this comes from this reactor plugin. Um, if I turn it off, we lose that buzzing sound, which is really pleasant, but this is the sound without the effects. Just a very classic kind of clean square wave with like a bit of filtering going on. Um, well, look at this effectrix in a second, but this this reactor is what's kind of doing all the legwork here. And I'll show you what I use. Uh, if you guys have a reactor, this is a free ensemble that you can get. It's called VHS. Um, and it's absolutely incredible. I use this probably more than any other plugin um, to literally just turn like sine waves. Oh, what's up, BH? Um, to turn just like sine waves and stuff into like cool textural things with movement but yeah it comes with a bunch of dope presets and has a lot of really cool like grit to it a lot of cool noise but that's the main sound there just crunches it out like crazy and then the frequency shifter isn't doing a ton it's just doing these little fills so with the frequency shifter on um, I put it into ring mod mode, which I do a lot. Um, this is kind of like for like the flume fans and like hi, this is flume era stuff. Um, quiet bison fans. Um, this is like a trick that they use a lot. If you put it into ring mod mode, I just put this on my master. Um, you can do this sort of thing. So wait for it. Oh, we've got things soloed. Which is a effect that I use a ton. So I'll put a frequency shifter on my master, put it into ring mod mode, and literally just like automate this frequency to go down. So it does shit like this. Which is something that like Hi This Is Flume has all over it. Quite Bison seems to use it a lot. Um, but it's a super simple thing. When you open frequency shifter, it's on the shift mode, but you won't get get that effect unless you put it onto ring mod, which is this one here. And then you can do all that. I've used it in the track in in the track from Photos of the Sun called Photos of the Sun. It's like the main effect on the bases and that sort of stuff. But I'll use it on my master and do some some stuff like that occasionally. Um yeah, so it's it's just doing this on the bass, exactly what we were just doing. It's on ring mod mode, and we're just doing this. Um, so it's not doing a ton. It's just getting giving you that little bit of movement at the end of the phrase. Like instead of doing like a pitch shift or like anything like that, it's doing the similar effect, but just using frequency shifter instead. So I think the effects maybe have that on it too. Maybe not. One of these sounds has a really frequency shifter ring mod sound to it though. I don't know which one it is. Maybe this one? No. That one's kind of like frequency shifter moment kind of thing. Hendrick moment. Hell yeah. But yeah, I use that quite a lot for fills instead of doing like pitch shifts and stuff like that. Um, just to quickly kind of like bang out what's happening in the intro and the vocal in general. Um, just because it's a super simple part of the track, we don't have to go too deep into it. But essentially with the vocal throughout this track, I usually try and find just two or three cool vocal parts um, that I can turn into one. So like I do that in Cobra with Jewels um, and the other track that I'm going to show you guys today. Same sort of thing. I try and find two or three cool vocal samples that work well with each other. So with this one, it's this. Let's solo this. This is just a straight up loop. Like, I think I changed two of the notes in it. But besides that, it's just like a, a full on loop. Uh, with no processing. <laughs> it's just high pass. That's the only thing. Um... And then there's the main vocal part, which comes from, let's listen to like really quickly. This is the, the OG vocal that it came from. Ready? 
I'm feeling high when I'm low. I need it more when you're close to me, 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 close to me. So like, low key listening to this vocal, like I didn't really like it that much, but I liked the the finished version of it I'm like feeling high when I'm low. I need it more when you're closed. all this first stuff i didn't use i just used when he does close to me so that turned into this and then see this is where i like i like to have two vocal parts that work together so in this space here, this part's actually from a different vocal sample from that original one. So But it almost sounds like this like like is that same vocal part if that makes sense. It feels like this fits in there to end the phrase. But usually like if if I don't have a vocalist on the track, um I usually try and find two things that I can chop up. I mean, that chop went from basic to pro real fast. I'll show you what I did on it because um, I got pretty experimental on it and I don't usually do this sort of stuff. So uh, we got a little Alter Boy on here. For those that don't know, this is a formant shifting and pitch shifting plugin. Um, it's pretty popular now, but um, I put it onto quantize mode and just brought the formants down a little bit. So what that's doing is it's just giving the vocal a bit of a different flavor, a little bit of a different tone. Close to me, so. close to me, close to me, close to me, close to me. Kind of brings the the pitch of it and like the just the vibe of it down a little bit. I shouldn't say pitch because it's not changing the pitch. It's just changing the tone of the pitch. Um, we've got it on quantize and then a bit of drive. So it just dirties up the vocal a bit, gives it a little bit of a different feeling. Um, we got a pretty like wet reverb. Close to me, close to me, close to me. A little bit of Decimort. Again, this is a plugin I use a ton, a ton, a ton. I just go through some of the presets usually, but I just downsampled the vocal a bit using like an SP 1200 preset. Close to me, close to me, close to me, close to me. Just adds a little bit of fuzz and like, I don't know, like grit to it. And then the real kind of like fun of it comes from Effectrix, um, which is giving it all those movement points and all those kind of like tape stops. So without it, close to me, close to, close to me, close to me. So then the Effectrix is doing all this stuff. Close to me, close to me, close to me, close to me. Close to me. I apologize guys this is this is the classic routing on a mac i swear to god no it's it's not even <laughs> yeah remix <laughs> um it's not even like a, a mac thing this just happens uh when you're trying to route everything through mac very like strangely so wait one sec okay this is what we got to do got to quit this real quick bear with me I'll, I'll fill the space with with some talking because my mic should still sound normal hopefully yeah this this uh this happens occasionally if any of you guys stream vocal only remix yo i could just sing you guys a song if that's what you guys would like i wish i could start a poll elevator music time sunscreen i'm on a different setup so i don't have i don't have all my my sound effects um for you guys who are chilling though i do stream um, a few times a week over at just like Tales X Beats on Twitch. I got a bunch of sound effects and, and a bunch of fun shit. Um, I need to close this program and open it again and pray that that worked. Wait for it. Wait for it. Classic. Uh, don't save. 
would it really be like an inaugural like stream without uh a little bit of technical difficulties i feel like this is a classic i gotta sing the effectrix vocal yeah the streams are fun we do we do beat battle competitions every single friday um which is super fun if you're a producer uh yeah they're just a good time sorry i need to just like the problem with this is there's no actual fix i just have to try a few things no, this is a bummer. Um, let's turn that off. Good. Let's turn this off. Fire. Okay. We might have just fixed it just right there. Okay. 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 Let's open Ableton back up. And if this doesn't work, guys, we're just going to open Minecraft. Loki. I got Minecraft loaded up at the bottom here. You guys can't see it, but... If it doesn't work, we'll just, you know, you guys put on a Spotify playlist and watch me play Minecraft for an hour. That's the alternative. Which would also be dope, so let's go. Yeah, straight up. Um, lasers, this is like this is like when when a DJ like fucks up the track mix and like has that moment of like humility you know what i mean where where people go okay cool a it's not pre-recorded and b like everyone fucks up and it makes it more fun but you guys should be able to hear this now wait for it okay no one is hearing that vocal on repeat hell yeah solved great and then let's just quickly listen to this <laughs> We fixed it. Hell yeah. Okay. We're back in business. Apologies for that, you guys. Um, if any of you stream or try and do stuff through Mac into Discord or OBS, you know the struggle. It can be pretty rough. But yeah, we're chilling. Okay. Sorry. I was just showing you guys the effect tricks on this vocal when when all hell broke loose there. But yeah, essentially, this is just like adding some, some cool stops. <laughs> yeah, IT help desk legit we're being chilling now um this has all like the fills Close and all the fun shit in the vocal so i just started kind of like when i when i do vocal chops or like have vocals that i'm not super hyped on i'll just throw effect tricks on them and start to mess around and see if it makes any cool movements and, and that sort of stuff i'll do that with lead synths as well um oh yeah clem that the one with hein is going to be awesome um i'll plug that too because full full love for the guy hein hein did all my artwork for for the last few projects and is an amazing artist so make sure you watch his master class too um the last little thing that's going on in the vocals that's kind of being played with is just this little like granular chop from oversampled. It sounds like this. So with that part, I, I literally just found things that worked with my chords. Like I had my chord progression going, or maybe it was just my bass line. Wait, through here. Um, Riffy, I mean, as long as you can get Ableton, um, you don't need much like Ableton and like a, a splice membership or something. Like most of these things come from splice. Um, for an example, like, I don't know if you know the producer Jewels, uh, he, he doesn't have a single third party plugin, nothing like that. So he's like doing it all on like a huge budget. Yeah, yeah, we're going to hop into the bass uh, in just a second here. 
Um, but yeah, I just want to show you guys just these vocal chops so nobody's um, concerned about those. We've got a f one more little thing. <laughs> Which is just this with some different effects on it, you know, just like a little bit of Alter Boy, um, a little bit of Pro L just to make it really loud. And then this one knob brighter, which I use sometimes. What's your opinion on using samples? Honestly, I think if you use them in a cool way, like totally cool. Um, I think like trying to dig for samples that are maybe a little bit less used is a cool and and. and like fun thing to do makes your music have a bit more originality to it um but i think as a producer that struggles getting vocals all the time i love i love the fact that you can cop decent quality vocals off splice um but yeah so that's all the vocals together <laughs> But yeah, I like to do this sort of thing with chords, like chopping them up to fit in with with the rest of the... Uh, oh, hell yeah. Slide in the DMs. Um, yeah, I think using samples is cool. Like, if you can if you can flip them in a cool way, is there a reason I don't use any send return tracks? Um, yeah, I, I don't have an original vocal on this track. If I've got original vocals, I do use four or five sends and returns for my reverbs and delays. But in general... Yeah, exactly. Resample, make them your own, flip them, add cool effects. But yeah, I only use sends and returns when I do like tracks with original vocals that I've tracked or with like guitars that I've tracked, things like that. Uh, otherwise, I usually just do it on the group or on the track itself. Like, for example, like things like this in the drums. Where are they? Like a lot of people would do like the delays on these breaks potentially in... A return track. This is just like a little drum and bass fill. But I just do them on the track and automate the dry wet where I need them. This one, yeah. But you can do it either way. Ultimately, like as long as you know what you're working with and how to control them, it doesn't really matter. It, it, it doesn't change the sound per se. Um, if you use a send and return, you can do the same thing on both as long as you know kind of how to manage them. But let's hop into kind of like the meat and bread of the drop super quick on this. Because I feel like that's usually what people are most interested in. Um, the drop on this is fairly simple in terms of layers. Um, yeah, there's only like, you know, this is it. It's just these few kind of tracks going. But I think like what I kind of wanted to talk about on these is how to kind of set yourself up for a cleaner mix by choosing things wisely and, and getting things set up nicely so your mix can come out a bit cleaner um so yeah the first thing i've got in here is just a simple chord which is we can unfreeze this really nothing crazy it's just like a, a preset that sounds like a super saw with just like a filter automation on it nothing crazy at all just that with a little bit of low mid scooped out. What free third party? Okay, yeah, lasers. I'll I'll tell you a bunch, and I'll I'll show you like a good uh, vocal processing chain too that you can do for pretty much no money um, for just stock Ableton stuff. Because again, it's not really about the plugins. It's it's generally just about how to use them. So we can definitely hit like a good vocal chain. <laughs> But yeah, so we just got this chord. This is hitting with two just straight up samples. And that's giving us like that first hit of the drop, the first downbeat. So that's just like an emphasized downbeat that we can use. A little bit of like a very short call to our response that's coming here. But got a little sub. A tonal kind of like wub sound all filtered out and then just this chord playing like the same chords as our build up nice and short um it's all being where is it um somewhere somewhere this is all being side chained oh yeah here 
little side chain to our kick, nothing crazy, and then a clipping plugin on this entire instrument group. Just in case something gets a bit loud, it'll get clipped a little bit. But yeah, so we've got those those elements there. Those are just the downbeat hits. And then the the majority of the the lead comes from this sound. So that's following like those hits. It goes into this. Actually, fire suggestion. We love that. Bam. We don't even need a search bar currently. Hopefully that's better for you guys. So yeah, we've got this going. This is literally, again, like someone mentioned earlier, samples. A lot of times, a lot of my stuff will start from a sample. So I found this like Max Styler bass loop. That sounded like that. I think there's a, a little effect going on that. So it sounded like this. Um, liked the tone of it and the kind of like cool starts and stops in it. So I just took that and chopped that into my main sort of melody. So essentially what I try to do when I write these lead melodies is I listen to the vocal part that I have in the buildup or whatever my main um, melody is through my buildup and try and find something that works off that nicely. So through here, the main buildup is. So what I'm looking for is just like a good call and response between those two melodies. Um, and for this one, yeah, I just went through that full loop and just found hits that felt good and just placed them in, in as like single, you know, eighth notes or whatever those are. And the trick here is that my bass and my chords don't move underneath it. So these act as just a leading tone on top of my chords. So I've got chords here as well that hit at the same time. Just straight up following my, my standard chord progression that I've written the whole song around. And then these on top just provide a new top note for each one of these hits. which keeps everything like um, familiar enough, like the chord progression stays consistent, but it adds enough interest because there's a melody that moves above it. So we've got that in there. These are literally just like the stock. Um, that's a lot to take in, yeah. I mean, I hope that it's not too crazy. If people have questions about that sort of stuff, let me know. But generally for, for drop, something that I see a lot of people do um, is make their chords a little bit too crazy in context with their melody. So uh, something that like Mr. Carmack said in a live stream a long time ago that really stuck with me was like, you want to have these shorter um, chord phrases or these more followable chord phrases and then have melodies um, on top that complement all the notes in the chord. So for example, with this chord, all the notes in this lead melody complement that. So like the low end of them all hits like hits the right note, but then these all have like a vocal sample that's a different pitch moving around the different notes of this chord. So yeah, a little bit of a Nero vibe. You're not wrong. I would agree with that actually. Um, but yeah, I try and keep that in mind. Like there's, there's a few things. We'll talk about it even more when we go into the second track really quick, but 
for these kind of like plucky chord based drops um it's easy to like set it up so the chords change too often like people have like you know things like this where the chords are kind of going crazy like um but that leads to your bass notes being a little bit weird against the chords um, or just moving too much. Um, when you play these songs live, if your bass line is moving too much in terms of pitch, uh, it can be a little bit confusing to people in the audience or people listening. Uh, so having your bass line be a little bit more simple and letting your melody carry all that movement, in my opinion, works really well um, if you can execute it. Will the stream be saved? I'm not too sure actually. I think that Bitbird usually puts them up on YouTube after, but I'm, I could be wrong. Yeah, so I think um, in this track, the sub and the chords stay super static. They just move through that exact same chord progression. And then, yeah, this lead... And this vocal part are just giving us all the melody and the interest in the drop. Cool. So just so um, people aren't wondering down the road, this is literally just like a straight up like FM um, pluck all through here if you want to know how to make this i'm pretty sure jewels did a tutorial on that def hadn't considered a lot of that yeah hell yeah i'm glad that you like it um this synth if you i think if you go to jewels tiktok you'll find it but this is a synth that he's used and i've used for a super long time shout out to fm operator stock synth little dynamic tube a little bit of saturation gives you this sound which is like pretty classic Joel's and I use it in Cobra. I've used I've used this sound in like pretty much every track, and I think Joel's has too. Little verb, little compression. Um, for people that need a really good free multiband compressor or dynamic EQ, this is the move. It's called TDR Nova. It's fully free. It's really really dope. For the person that asked about vocal chain, um, this is something that I would suggest if you are strapped for cash, aka or have no cash, TDR Nova. It's probably like the best um, like dynamic EQ that I've found that's free for sure. Um, someone asked about like chord progressions too. Do you think... Uh, yeah, 100%. 100% you could make this um exact same thing on fl um i'm pretty sure you can find like a free fm synth for sure um someone asked about chord progressions let me just join all these um i don't necessarily have a favorite chord progression but i do have by far like a favorite yo thanks for linking the high wind yeah it's really really dope alternative to like pro q3 and that sort of shit um I don't have a favorite chord progression, but I really, really do have a favorite um, chord shape. And I think you guys would probably recognize it. And it was helpful to me to kind of realize that a lot of people use this. Um, like, I can't speak for everybody, but I know that like, if you listen to Duskus's music, my music, um, Flume, this is like the goaded chord structure. All right, so let's say you're gonna make like a D minor chord, right? You make your like first note, right? It's the first note in our chord. We're just gonna do it with a sine wave. You move it up three semitones. So there we go. We've got our minor third interval right there. And then we get our perfect fifth, which is up four semitones. One, two, three, four, right? So we just got like a D minor chord. The goaded kind of like chord shape that everybody uses is just this you take the the minor third or the major third if your chord was like d major you just take this note you just put it up an octave and your chord progressions will sound something like this um let's do that and then let's do like that instead of 
this, which is like the the normal triads, which sound like, you know, so so, but just taking that one note and making the the top note of your chord the third of your triad instead of in the middle. That's the sound. That's the voicing. That's the voicing that everybody uses. Um, not to like arrow to anybody's secrets, but like rushing back by flume. Yeah. It's like literally just like, I don't even know what inversion this would be called, but this is it. <laughs> this is what everybody uses. And then if you really want to like, you know, even like a lot of songs tracks. And I mean, I'm just speaking from what I hear in their tracks. Maybe they don't do this, but, um, Son and Duskus just taking out the fifth and just having the root note and the third as your leading tone. You know what I mean? So we do that. And then there you go. Um, you've got that sort of vibe. Like, you know, if we did this, this will sound like, you know, the start of a lot of tracks from artists that you might like. You know what I mean? That sort of vibe. Um, yeah, simple is key. Legit. I, I find like oftentimes when, when I start going to ham on chords, like if I put in the fifth and then let's put in like also a seventh, it can be cool. But nothing to me is, impa is as impactful as just that like third like third interval major or minor but anyways i don't have a favorite chord progression but i do lean on those voicings a lot um for example these same sort of thing these pitch chords i will guarantee you that they are the exact same voicing look at that so this is my chord progression for this song So that's exactly what we were just looking at right there. So if we unfreeze this, take that top note, there's my minor triad, and there's the third up an octave. And then just the bass line following the root note. Yeah, so it's it's pretty simple, um, and and to be honest, most of my songs and a lot of artists that you might like aren't doing anything too crazy with the chords. Often that is the move, like truly, um, yeah. And what Johnny's saying in the chat is super super important. It makes it so much easier to mix when your chords aren't as stacked out, because essentially what you want to do is, and like this is a pretty general thing to say but you want to imply that harmony and those chords instead of having your synth actually play that chord. So what I mean by that is, sorry about this like motor sound. It's a little bit obnoxious when you don't have the beat playing. Um, but essentially I want to imply that I'm doing a bigger chord and that's a, a loops exactly back to what we we're talking about with this lead chop. I've got very simple chords playing underneath it. And then that lead chop is, is implying that there's like a seventh chord playing or a ninth chord or like, you know what I mean? The melody is what's making my chords feel a bit more complex. And that happens everywhere. Implies and spread the notes to different instruments. Exactly, exactly, Benji. That's a perfect way to put it. Exactly that. Um, it allows you to mix way cleaner because essentially like what happens when you take a bunch of chords. So for example, people that really layer out a lot of chords, if you had this duplicated a bunch of times and a bunch of synths playing all these exact same notes, um, the subs are banging. Yeah, they, they worked out pretty well in this. <laughs> But if you just like, and there's nothing really wrong with this, but 
if you take your your main chords and you're trying to make them feel bigger and you're doing that by just duplicating and changing the sound um, you can get a good result but keep in mind that every time you duplicate those same chords the fundamental frequency of each one of those layers is going to be playing the exact same sound so if I change up this sound a bunch you know what I mean like if this sound was some different type of waves and that sort of shit uh, sounded like this and that was my other chord and I layered this in to get more like character out of it or whatever let's make this one cleaner um, you need to keep in mind that this second layer and the first layer they're both going to generate the exact same sound in this range so like if you filter that and just listen to that and this one here, if we do the same sort of thing. There's a little bit of bleed through, but that general range sounds almost exactly the same. So what you're going to have to do is, is realize that like you're not adding any different tone or anything to this mid section or your low mids. You're just adding volume. You're essentially just like, you know, doing this. Let's undo those EQ moves. And with this layer in the mid range, you're kind of just doing this. You're just kind of doubling the volume in that section. So instead, I'm not just going to tell you like a problem and not a solution. Instead, what I would do, instead of just duplicating this exact MIDI, I would change the voicing of these notes and the synth sound. So for example, I'll leave my, my root note the same. That's fine. But let's put that up an octave and then let's put this one down an octave even. All of a sudden... Yeah, 100%. Um, 100%. I rarely layer in my low mids because oftentimes it's only just adding volume. If I do, I'll change the notes, the voicing of the notes, so I don't get the same fundamental frequencies just stacking on top of each other. Um, and the real trick, in my opinion, this is all like opinion stuff, but to get your chords sounding bigger is to have a bass tone that is playing just the root note that has a tone on top of it. So the noise and stuff from this bass layer, which is super simple, is just like an analog preset bass um, with a bit of overdrive, a little bit of filtering. You know, I'm pretty sure this is just like a straight up. Yeah, it is. Wait, let's do this. Um, unfreeze. This is called smoked analog bass in Ableton. Uh, it might have been from Ableton 10. It might not be in Ableton 11, sadly. But Smoked Analog Bass. This is just like a Ableton bass preset that I OTT'd and filtered a little bit for the tone of my bass. So I, I think that this bass layer is more beneficial than adding more layers to my chords. It gives a lot more like. Oh no, is our, is our thing doing it again? Are we looping again, guys? Damn. What's going on here? Apologies. One sec. Oh my goodness. Why does this keep happening? No. Bummer. But we figured out how to fix it. We figured out how to fix it this time. It's that damn Effectrix again. Yeah, I was saying, it sounds... Yo, what up, Thor? It sounds like emergency loop on CDJs. Um, yeah, I don't know why it's doing it so much today. It usually happens like once a week, but it's happened twice already. But we figured out how to fix it. So that's good. Um, but yeah, so those are all like the kind of main sections of the drop here. Um and to kind of like wrap all of this track up if there are questions about this track just let me know yeah lucas i actually felt really good about this track it kind of it was kind of funny like um i don't know if i should yeah i'm stoked to play it live but Um, 
feedback percent. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm stoked to play it live, but this track, it kind of came together in a cool way. I originally had a different track in mind for um, for the Golden Finch compilation, and then and I, I couldn't end up using it, so I had to pivot to this track quick and kind of finish it quickly, but I really like how it turned out. Um, but yeah, those are all the main layers in it. Um, there's nothing crazy. There's no crazy processing. Um, my lead synth group just has that TDR Nova again, just getting a little bit of like something that was bothering me here. Hell yeah. Thanks, Gamma. Um, and a little bit of a limiter just to catch any peaks. So... And then just to kind of spice it up afterwards, I just added in these little fills that worked really well, like just like scratches and stuff. Oh, that one's literally nothing. Little bass hit and just some little, some little fills. So this one's like a cashmere one. And then like a, a kind of like cartoony sounding one. Um, I reckon that this EQ is here because I usually tune these. Um, and the way I tune things is I literally just put an EQ on them. Turn on my like monitoring mode on my EQ. And figure out which notes are being hit. So I just look at like the biggest uh, frequency peak. And try and figure out what note it is. Because I wanted this to be a bit in tune. So I tuned this little like damn we're looping again why oh no what is happening here uh we should be all good let me turn off that we don't need any of these on but that shouldn't be our culprit this is a bummer um at least we're catching it quicker hmm hmm okay might be because this session's a little bit big. Let's see. But apologies for that. Yeah, three times. It literally never happens like this. Let's hit a Minecraft stream, guys. Yeah, it stopped. This is brutal. Um, but yeah, those are the main kind of things throughout this whole track. Stream wants it looping. Hell yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Six. <laughs> um, why do you high-pass your bass? Um, these ones are all high-pass just because they're layers. So like this top layer... <laughs> And this top layer, those are high-passed just to get rid of the sub because I've already got this as a sub. How do you make songs quick enough to not lose the interest of the initial idea? Um, and you seem to always dip right after high-passing. Do I? Yeah, maybe. Oh, here. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I do that. Yes, uh, that is the thing I do. I don't really think about it, but I do that. Um, okay, so the first question was, how do I make tracks quick enough? Um, I think, like, the trick for me is to just start a lot of music. Um, and a lot of tracks I don't make quick enough to get to get the idea out before I'm sick of it. Um, luckily, like, something that's really helped me with that is having imposed deadlines from third parties. So, like... You know, Bitbird being like, this is the release date and we need the masters. And I'm like, fuck, okay, I got to finish it. I got to finish it. Or like things like that um, really help put the gas on for me because I, like probably most of you, will just spend way too long tweaking and, and finishing and, and messing with tracks. Um, the other thing that I think about is a quote from a homie of mine named Versace. Um, I don't know if you guys know him. He used to be in the more like beats world, like the SoundCloud beat making world. He recently started like doing more vocal stuff and a bit more pop stuff, but he's really dope. He's like been one of my favorite artists and a good friend for a long time. Um, he did this interview a long time ago where he just said like, um, he said in the interview, I've never had a favorite song that was polished. And I thought, damn, if that isn't me, I don't know what it is. Like I've always loved and been drawn to songs that are a little bit more raw 
Um, and I noticed that I took a ton of time to polish all my tracks like crazy and, and get rid of a lot of character from them, from mixing them too heavily. And when I stopped doing that, I started making tracks way faster and was way more proud of the results. Like, I don't know. I've, I've never, I've never had a favorite song that I put on repeat all the time that has been like perfectly mixed and crazy mixing. I've always liked more raw music that's a little bit more like sketchy like for example in this um i showed this session to somebody and they commented on how much it clicks and pops like through here where is it uh through the breakdown so this so like usually you'd go in you know and you do your little like crossfades on these where the cut points are so they don't have those like little clicks and pops and stuff. But recently I've just been like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to keep those. And I like that. You know, like a lot of people like would really adamantly try and get those out and, and make sure they're not in there. But I'm just trying to like not worry as much about those things. Cause those things don't make the song good. Like, I've seen like recently like this dude on TikTok that that is like doing all these EQs that are like this and he's like it's about the small details and like he's got like a bazillion little cuts in his EQ and all this sort of stuff in the vocals and all that and realistically like if you have to do that to the sound it's just maybe not the right sound and like realistically this isn't going to help um, if the melody and the, the writing isn't cool so i don't know i've been i've been trying to not focus as much on that um yeah exactly keep the clicks i love it um yeah i've been trying to focus on not like nerding out on my mixes because i used to do it way 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 too much i've got a few things that work for me and like i've been kind of staying with those um if no one's got any questions about this session i just want to show you guys the master <laughs> please don't quote that six <laughs> Um, I want to show you guys just the mastering chain really quickly. Um, this is kind of like my standard, uh, mastering chain, which again, don't change this. Just put this on your track, leave it as is. Don't even listen to it. Just export it really. And you should be fine. Um, no, I'm kidding. But yeah, these ones, we can negate those. Those are literally just effects that, uh, like happen across the mix, like an auto pan and, uh, like an endless smile to just make things move a little bit like this, you know, the little build up flare. Oh, show the bass. Did I not show the bass? Um, oh, right. The sub, I didn't maybe show the sub. Um, the sub is very, very simple. This is like the best sub bass ever. In my opinion, I love the, it's called hip hop sub bass. And these are the settings I use on it. If you are in Ableton 11, note that it is not called Hip Hop Sub Bass anymore. They've changed it. It is called Basic Sub Sign. So just so you guys know, they changed the name going into 11. A lot of people thought it was gone, but it's not. It's just changed name. So this Basic Sub Sign in 11 is the sub for this. Ooh, I use that one. Hell yeah, it's great. With a little bit of distortion, a little bit of tone. Gives you that. These OTTs aren't even on. And, oh, this is perfect that you asked this because I do dip right here pretty often. Um, and that's because the second overtone of a lot of bass sounds is pretty, like, overbearing in that range. Uh, I guess I only did it in this. But, oh, yeah, both of these. You'll see a lot that when you, when you layer bass sounds... Obviously, like, you choose which one is going to be your sub. Like, this one is the sub octave right here. And then this next overtone that pops up often leads to a lot of muddiness. Yeah, there's a high pass on this. Um, this is, like, again, like, I'm trying not to be as picky about this sort of thing. But um, I'll finish this thought first. You, you get a lot of buildup in the second overtone of your sub. So that's right here. This is our first, like our main 
tone and this is our first overtone this peak right here you get a lot of build up there naturally as you like layer bass sounds and and chords and that sort of stuff so i usually just try and scoop that out a little bit yeah and and that is kind of the answer meadow below 20 hertz you don't really need in your sub um i do this for an issue called dc offset um which is like damn we're gonna go deep now um and this is a problem that you may run into when you're playing your songs um grand wait grand you lure granulator um what am i looking for i'm looking for who's that dude um that's an ableton button i never pressed the dc button it's very important um if you want to play your songs on like big sound systems um what's this dude's name he makes like really crazy really really crazy stuff um very sound design intensive sakura burst there we go we had to see it um where was that um sakura burst sakura burst in this so okay so check this out so if we go to like a bunch of his stuff let's see gotta find a good example here um you know what? i'm just gonna pull one of these in and pray nope so a lot of times you'll get this happening especially if you've got saturation on a sound actually you know what? let's just do it like this so for our sub we've got saturation happening right we've got this distortion is linked to this saturator and what a saturator does i mean most of you probably know um sub clean sub sign so this is the reason that i put low passes on things like that um basic sub what's it called yeah okay when you have a saturator and this is again like way more than it has to be but I, I kind of like i went to school for for things like this so like um i have a hard time kind of getting it out of my my head to to change these things but what happens is when you saturate a sound um in general let's just sub you create a bunch of overtones right here's just our clean sub once we saturate it we've got all these new overtones being created right so what you have to realize with a saturator and i think a lot of people don't realize initially is that they don't only create overtones in a positive direction into higher frequencies so up towards our 10k they also create new harmonics going the other way so here's our our root note of our sub it's also creating a harmonic sequence this way towards this way wait which way is my camera yeah this way it's also creating even lower frequencies when you saturate a sound so you got two options there you can turn on your dc offset which is essentially going to cut that or you can cut it manually after you saturate because check out just like how where the audio is trending on this eq without this slow pass see that big bump that's about to happen you can imagine that it gets massive over here but it's just too low that you can't hear it so i cut that out because the problem happens when you play that on really big speakers it tries to it tries to recreate that that sound so essentially like what happens is like if this is the head of your speaker and you've got way too much inaudible low end your speaker gets stuck out at a far like you know your speaker moves back and forth um, if you've got that like build up down here your speaker gets stuck in a forward position and it can't go back and forth anymore all the way so you lose a ton of power um, so that's what the dc offset button does and you'll notice it i really wish that i could have got this to work um the sakura burst stuff has like a ton of really really like dc offset unfriendly sounds yeah like this 
Um, here. Okay, perfect. So can you guys see how this this audio waveform is? Do you always cut at twenty, or just when you saturate? Um, I usually do cut around twenty. The 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 like end all fix of it is to just do that on your master. Um, I don't think I have anything doing that on my master because I did it on my bass group. But yeah, generally you could do that on your master. Um, hell yeah. I'm glad these tips are helpful. But um, here's something that you can easily see if you need to do like a DC offset thing on. Because check this out. So when you look at this sample, do you guys notice how much farther the waveform goes down as opposed to how high it goes up? So like look at the peak down here. It's like double um double that of of how high it goes upwards. I don't know how to say that properly. The downward amplitude is higher than the upward amplitude. I don't know. Does that make sense? That is a DC offset issue. It happens with horns when you record them. It happens with your vocal if you sing into your mic a certain way where the the diaphragm of the mic gets um pushed into a certain position like a compressed position or depressed. I don't know which way it would be, but immediately you can do this. If you grab a saturator, check this out and you turn on DC offset and you freeze this and flatten this. See how much more even it is now that we did that DC offset on it. So now this sound will have a lot less low inaudible rumble which can be a problem on big speakers. So I'll take that, that DC offset off. So that's what it looked like. And then we really evened it out. So yeah, that's what DC offset is. It's not super like grand scheme, not super important, but it can help your mix just be a little bit cleaner. So if you have a saturator on your master or something, just flip that DC offset on and it will help you if you ever play your music on big, big, big speakers. Um, yeah, hell yeah. Um, do any of you guys have any questions about this track? The bass is super simple. Um, the, the other layer of the sub is literally just the sample from Ramzoid that I've been using a lot um, called moaning moya 808 and i just use it as a bass layer porn star moans perfect i'm so sorry bitbird um just sounds like this i use that as a bass layer all the time <laughs> just gonna <laughs> just gonna clear my search there 18 plus stream. I'm so sorry. I might as well get in a hot tub. Um, Holy Chimungs, if you are saturating, you are creating a harmonic sequence in the opposite direction as well. So it's safe to use pretty much always. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the audio engineer nerdy stuff is good to know. It's helpful because if you have issues, you can solve them. But I try not to let them like take over too much but same thing i eq out that that interval or like that overtone this one because things tend to stack up there i've got three i've got the extra sub let's get rid of this that's not in the track i got the extra sub the clean sub and the bass mids this is my whole bass I got just the chords, the lead, and then this this uh, chord chop from earlier. So that's layered in there too with this. Um, which one, Motorsport? The one that's on this one right here. How do I sidechain it so well? Um, I sidechain to my kick and my snare. Let me know if that's the one you meant, Motorsport. My problem is sometimes I don't think enough about the arrangement and focus on 
too much how the kick and snare should sound. 100%, man. I do that all the time, too. Um, honestly, like, focus on just the song. Is the song cool? Because if the song's, like, not the vibe, then no matter how much mixing you do and how your snare and kick sound, it doesn't really matter um, a ton if the song isn't isn't cool. So, yeah, like, I think it's Duskus that always says, just write it with a piano. And if it sounds dope on just a piano, then it'll sound cool once you start, you know, designing it out and stuff. Um, this EQ is, is pretty simple. I'm just trying to get a little bit of extra, like, roundness out of the sound by boosting some sub and cutting out that first overtone. So this sound, this is the sound that when it gets really loud right here, you hear like the really nasty digital clicking and popping. So I usually just take that out a little bit. But yeah, both of these sounds both have sub in them, which is like a bit of a faux pas, but I liked how it sounded. So I just went with it. Um, and then, yeah, a little bit of a low pass again, just to get rid of anything weird. But, and then these ones are literally just straight up. Like there's no EQ. Oh, there is an EQ on this one, but that's just how many hours to practice lead to this track. I'm not 100% sure what you mean. Um, but this track probably took me like, probably like 10 hours of production, I would say. Something something close to that because I mess around too much and like go too deep into things. Um, the last thing that I think is really cool in this is just this. I really loved, I really loved uh, this build up, which was just like, I took this laser sound and tuned it and, and like warped it to be on my grid. Tell, oh, how long have I been making music? Um, yeah, I've been making music for like, how old am I? I'm 29. I've been making music since I was 16. So 13 years I've been making music. Well, actually I started playing guitar when I was like eight. So like a long time. At a song concert? Who played it at a song con? Oh, just before the show. Hell yeah. That's sick. Um, But yeah, this little buildup I was super hyped on, which is literally just like a tuned, like, I don't even know what this would be called, like laser thing. And something, something, oh, okay, this is perfect. Okay, check this out. Look at this, look at this sample. This is the biggest example of DC offset you could possibly see. That is DC offset right there, 100%. And you know what? I didn't cut it out of this because I liked how it, it messed up the rest of the track. It like, yeah, <laughs> crazy. Loudest sound, loudest sound ever. <laughs> right? It's like scuffed, like super scuffed. Um, but I like the way that it messes up all the other sounds. Like it's so loud and, and messed up that it distorts everything else at the same time. So check this out. It like gets to the point where like the whole track is just like breaking apart because this is so weird and loud. But yeah, I didn't cut it out in this because I liked it. I kept that DC in there to make it, you know, be an effect. But yeah, then there's just like little extra things in the track that just give it a bit of flavor. Little white noise hits, little like, you know, down samplers and little chopped up things. <laughs> It looks like the Grinch's fingers. Damn, that is true. Um, but yeah, sounds like this, I think really kind of like, you know, finish the vibe. I think like a cool lead sound and cool synths um, all work well, but having like the little ear candy things that kind of just do this, like these sounds, are, are I think to me what kind of sells it, having just little fills. What are the melodies in the second half? So the only change in the melody is that it gets higher. So 
That stays the same. All that stays the same. I'm pretty sure that all stays the same. Yeah, and then in the second drop, I'm pretty sure it's this. No, that's the same. It might be just this. Yeah, so there's this like chord, like granular chord that goes over the drops. In the first drop, it's this pitch. And then the second drop is just an octave higher. So, and it's only for the first note. So this one's... And yeah, again, nothing crazy on this. This is a plugin I use a lot. It's called Doubler. Um, and when we go into the next track, we'll do the next track quickly because I feel like I've been just like talking about shit like, <laughs> I don't know, kind of rapid fire for an hour and a bit. I don't know how long we're supposed to do these, but um, maybe not for a hell yeah. Um, yeah, Doubler, I use this to just get things out of the way. So like, you'll see it a lot in the next track, but this is really far out to the sides. So, so without Doubler, it sounds like this. And then Doubler makes it do this. Really, really wide. Um, and I do that because instead of EQing these layers like crazy, I'm kind of just trying to slot them in with my stereo field. So that sits with this synth, which is really mono. And then this one just shoots out to the sides. So yeah, instead of EQing and getting those to fit together, I just pushed one out to the sides and put one in the middle. That way they can, it's exactly like wider. Yeah, exactly. We didn't finish the master chain. We'll do that really quick and then we'll bounce. Uh, to the next track. Um, I can't open this plugin. I put this on here in Ableton 10. And for some reason, my licenses don't work in Ableton 11. And I haven't sorted it out since I upgraded my computer. So I can't open this. But this is a plugin called a Apex Vintage Exciter, I think. Um, which literally just boosts the highs. Hacker, not a hacker. I do own this plugin. I just need to get it working with 11. Every time I open it, it just crashes the session, which is sad. Um, and then standard clip. So I generally use a clipper on my tracks before they hit my master uh, limiter. Exactly, exactly, Damon. This is, uh, or Damano, Damano? Tails Ableton is cracked. Not anymore, six. When I started out, it was. It's not anymore. It is licensed now, thank God. Um, stop accusing me, I'm gonna get all flustered. Um, but yeah, I'll use a, a plugin called standard clip. Damon is right. Okay. Word. Um, why don't I put the master chain on the master? It's a very good question. Let me go through it because I keep getting questions and I get sidetracked very easily. A little pea brain dude. Um, yeah, I put a standard clip on here. <laughs> Um, and that's just getting like the top of the, the peaks of, of my track, just so I can get, um, a little bit more play. Tails getting grilled. Yeah, you're not wrong. Just so I can get a little bit of play out of my maximizer. So early on in my chain, I'll use this standard clip to just cut down my volume and some of the peaks a little bit. So yeah, it's like double limiting, but two different, um, kind of like processes to do that. Cause clipping... Um, it doesn't actually turn down your volume. It literally just truncates your volume. So they're different processes. And they got a bit of a different vibe to them. So I use this plugin called Standard Clip. I usually set it to clip at just over, um, just over zero. So like it's default at zero. I set it to cut things off at about like 0.6 to one decibel. <laughs> And you can see it's just cutting off just like the little bit of the top of everything. Um, after that, it goes into an OTT, which is like literally memed on, but I do it. I legitimately do this. I turn up the time and put my percent like around 15 or below. Um, it just gives me a little bit more control and a bit more level. It helps my mix be a little bit more like uh, in line, I guess, a little bit more tame. Um, 
What up, great PNG? Welcome, welcome. Um, the last thing on it is literally just this one knob brighter plugin. Um, yeah, it glues it a little bit, 100%. Um, I use this one knob because I chronically mix everything way too low um, in my high end. Let's go, Gray. Gray PNG, do you want a beat tag? What's up? This is Gray PNG music. You can you can clip that and put that in the start of your tracks, bro. I got you. I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, I use this because I always cut out way too much high end out of all my shit, like chronically. Um, so I use just this to just pull in like a little bit more high end to my track. Um, is literally just like a saturator. <laughs> Hell yeah. And then, yeah, and then I master it with, uh, or like bring it up to full volume with Ozone 8, usually the maximizer. I make the character a bit faster and I add a bit of stereo independence. I tend to add too much high end, not me. I'm the opposite. Um, but yeah, I add a bit of stereo independence, pull my character down a little bit because I want it to be a bit more punchy. Can you explain the time thing in OTT? Yeah, if you hate OTT and you think it's overrated, it might be because you haven't messed with this time section here. Um, the time section does this. So like, let's just make this really dramatic. I'll pull this down and then I'll tell you why I master here instead of on my... Do I leave 12 dB? I do not, bro. I am clipping when I go into my master. Just, uh, yeah. Like if I turn the two volume plugins off and OTT, this is what my master looks like. <laughs> Um, 15, yeah, 15 LUFS type beat and just like that it's done. Yeah. I, I clip, um, there's, there's more like tech stuff to that too. Um, hell yeah. Um, keep this in mind guys. When you, when you're metering in Ableton, um, it's a little bit misleading. There's two different pieces of info we're getting here. If I turn off my maximizer, you need to realize that there are two different um, meters happen happening here. We're getting an LUFS reading, or sorry, um, an RMS reading and a peak value reading. Our peak value is clipping, but our RMS value is not clipping. So keep that in mind. So look at the light green meter down here. It's right here. You are not going to get digital distortion unless your RMS value passes zero. Um, DAWs are crazy now. They're actually crazy. Like the ceiling, like the ceiling for audio is so high. Um, yo, thank you, Gray. I appreciate that. Um, even though I'm peaking, my peaks are going over zero, my RMS value is not. So I'm not getting any digital distortion. So essentially like what I can do is just like capitalize on a bit of loudness and then have my standard clip and my ozone just like, you know, getting that little bit of edge off when in reality, without ozone and standard clip, my beat's already pretty much as loud as it should be. What these are really doing more than anything is tucking my drums in. Listen to my drums before and after. Then I'll turn these on. Literally all it's doing is like pulling my snare and my kick in and making them feel glued to the mix. Um, it's not really changing the overall volume of the track much at all. Um, but that's usually like what my mastering chain looks like. Um, more cohesive, yeah. What does the final waveform look like? Um, actually, I'll show you guys a cool thing I do that, with that. Let me show you this other track because it has just something that I really wanted to show you guys really quick. Um, 
yeah, you would think it looks like a brick, but it, it actually doesn't. Um, and I will say the way that I, hell yeah, high wind, the way that I reference, oh wait, I didn't tell you why the master is like this. The reason that I do the master on a group instead of my actual master down here is because um, when I'm referencing mixes that I like, um, if your mastering chain is on your master channel down here, then when you pull in a track that's already been mastered, you have to switch your master chain on and off to hear the unmastered version of your reference track. Like that's going through your mastering chain again. You have to switch it on and off to AB. If you do it in a group, like it'll be way more, you can do that differently. Yeah, there might be a better way to do it. I started doing this like back in Ableton 10. So, or even earlier than that maybe, but like I would usually put my master here when I'm finalizing my mix and then I can drag reference tracks down here. Can you do exit out on reference tracks? Swanky main. We got Hein Hammers in the chat, everybody. Do they have B, do we have BTT going over here? Can I hit a clap? No, I can't, sad, okay. Um, but yeah, I'd master here, drag reference tracks down here. So they're not going through anything on the master chain. So realistically, Ooh, this will crash my, crash my session if I do this, but, um, I won't cause this Aphex is on here. I put this here, leave my master empty so I can reference easier. Yeah, I think you can, I think you can do that. I think I just wasn't aware of that, but I don't know. I do them on here. I don't know. I just have done it for, for ever. Don't dox me. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, so this is the other track I wanted to show you guys super, super quickly. We won't go as in depth. Um, I just wanted to show you a few kind of like fun things that you can do. Um, this is going to be like my next Bitbird single. So if I'm not supposed to leak this Bitbird, sorry. Uh, here, let's just listen to the start of it. Don't let go. I'm keeping you high. Exclusive. <laughs> After it all, I know we don't need a reason to start again. Don't let go. I'm keeping you high on hope. After it all. vocalist is a splice vocal you can you can get some some good vocals off splice yeah the tails discord is popping in this chat right now and they did hear it first they did hear it first but yeah it's a splice vocal um i thought about replacing it with a, a an original vocal but i just liked it um yo thank you guys i'm stoked that you guys like it that roman silver vibe yeah i dude i mean me and Vinny have a, a lot of love for a lot of the same music um but yeah let me show you guys just like this is what i really wanted to kind of like cover and then we went into like a bunch of other stuff which is totally cool um about like writing to make your mix easier um and like the main thing that i try and think of when i'm writing drops is um splitting my mix into four different categories or four sections of my mix. So if you're looking at an EQ, let's just open it big. I'm thinking of my mix always in four different sections. So those sections are basically 1K and up in my middle and my stereo channel. So that's one and two, my 1K and up in the middle and 1K and up to the sides. And then my 1K and down in the middle and 1K and down to the sides. 
So those are the four kind of spaces I break my mix up into. And essentially my kind of like golden rule for my mixing and for my writing is to make sure I only have one main element in each one of those four sections at any given time. So I'll kind of like break that down a little bit to what I mean. And this track kind of like has that well. So this this bass, this bass is the the golden youth bass or like main golden youth sound. So this is like the main bass line. Um, essentially this is, yeah, this is the sound from Golden Youth and what will be this. Um, and it's like a, a tom sample, just that. Is it side change? I think it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's what we're going to, we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about those four main elements. So before we kind of hop into them, like what the sounds are like specifically, I'll just show you like what they are in this. So when I'm thinking of my like a thousand hertz and up, I guess I'm doing things backwards. A thousand hertz and up. Is that up for you guys? Yeah, up. Um, we've got this. So this is um, my thousand hertz and up to the sides. So. When I go through this, I've got this vocal sample, which I think is a son sample, just like the son vocal cymatics sound. So I've got this whole section um, chorused, which is pushing it like nicely out to the sides, um, as well as some of the reverb stuff is making it quite wide. Chorus will obviously make your stuff a bit wider. So this is in the sides. Wait, that's in the sides, that's in the sides, and that's in the sides. So I'm treating these all as one sound. This whole group is one sound as far as I'm concerned. So this is my 1000 hertz on the sides. This sound is my 1000 hertz in the middle. The sides do have a bit of mono, for sure. It's not 100% out to the sides, but they're my, like, you know, wider leaning sounds. This is my 1,000 hertz and up. Kind of like, uh, I guess that's not too much like 1,000 hertz, but this is like my lead in the middle. Is that sound? What are these? Just make sure. Sub, okay, cool. Yeah, so this is my, like, middle... I might have that backwards. These might be my widened sound. When I'm on stream and like listening through this, I don't know. Sometimes I get confused which one's which. But yeah, one of these will be in the middle and one will be out to the side. So I always try and like think of that when I'm writing is like when I'm starting to add more layers or melodies and things like that. I'm always thinking like where in the stereo field it has to be added um, to make it make sense. Do you avoid phasing in the sides with all those layers? How do I avoid it? Um, essentially, you're not going to have to really worry too much about phasing issues with sounds that are above a thousand hertz. Um, essentially, the waves, like the sound waves are too tight to actually like phase and cancel each other. Like the chances of that happening are, are too low because at that high of like a, a wavelength, it's, it's way too random for them to actually like overlap and cancel. It's literally things like 200 hertz and below where the waveform is really long and flowing. That's where you get like the big chances of phasing. Um, so I never really worry about phase in the high end of my track um, unless I'm adding like phasers or unless I'm specifically duplicating a track. Um, would you remix Shalu in the future? Hell yeah, I would. I love Shalu. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's kind of like how I try and think of, of my mixes at all times. And then same with the low end. Um, 
when I'm when I'm mixing in my low end, where's my like actual bass is. I'm trying to think of like what my mono sound is going to be in my low end, which is obviously going to be this one. Just my straight up sub. And I did some weird EQ stuff on this, um, but this isn't like fully, fully mixed, but um, yeah, I did like a weird mid side thing on this to keep my like lows very, very mono. And then these layers are that one and this one are layers that are a little bit more widened from that mono signal. So they're not, they don't need to be EQ'd with each other a ton because they're already in their own space in the stereo field, which helps a ton. And then this is going to be, yeah, just some like upper fuzz stuff, but Um, but yeah, I, I just like wanted to point that out in this track because I do it a ton um, when I'm when I'm writing is just trying to think of those four regions and like what's going to sit in each one. Of course, you can have things like complementing each other in those regions, like those four kind of spaces, but it, it helps to have just one main thing in each of them. Um, that's going to be like your focal point in that zone. Uh, the other thing that's kind of fun with this track is there's this thing that just repeats the whole track. <laughs> Um, I do this a lot, especially in like the remix that I did for On Planets, um, picking one note, like a really powerful note in my key and just having that repeat throughout almost the whole track. Cause it just plays with the chords nicely. Like if you listen to just this sound against the chords, and this goes through my drop too. Which can sound kind of weird, like when you listen to it on its own, but having having one note that's really prominent in your key play against all your chords gives you those really cool, like spicy chord sounds every once in a while, and still keeps them simple. I don't know if you guys like listen to, um... yes, the API five sixty is doing a little bit of coloring on that vocal for sure. Where did you see that one? I'll open that up. I use the API five sixty on vocals. On finding good slice vocals, search vocals, um, and then sort them by date added and go to like page like, you know, 400 and start looking through there. Um, that's usually what I do. I'll show you guys another cool plugin thing really quick, but um, that's the sort of stuff that I try to do when I'm, when I'm writing things. If you guys are curious about how any of these sounds work. Um, drums, I don't really consider in that because my drums are generally like... Um, like we talked about in the first track, are set up with my ozone here. So I reckon this will be pretty similar. So if I solo my kick and snare, we're getting between like, yeah, like two and four decibels of, of, of like limiting or gain reduction there. And then if I bring my sub into this, which was this one here. It's the same thing. If my sub was any louder, actually, my sub could be a little bit louder in this song. Looking at this, like I could probably pump that a little bit, something like that. Um, those those three things, like my drums and my sub, are my anchor in my track. So I don't really like consider those a lot when I'm mixing. I set them up like this, like how I just did with my kick, my sub, and my snare, and then I don't touch it. Um, sometimes I'll mess with a bit of distortion and tone. Like this one's got a bit of distortion on it from the serum patch, um, which is like, just like a bass that I use often from my little sample pack. Um, and then the other layers for the tone of my bass come from actual other synths that are all high passed like this, which is like another one that I use a lot. 
the tails mandatory level it's called um or layer and this one's like a bass guitar loop that i just chopped and those are like the tone of my bass Um, something I did want to show you guys though really quickly is like a really fun way to make leads. Um, and it's how I made the golden youth lead and this one. So this sound here, um, I think I have the, I don't know where it would be, but the, like the OG like chain for this, but I'll show you what I do. Like I usually try and find sounds that have, um, intervals built in so you can hear that this is like this note and oh that's an octave somewhere in here there's there's an interval we'll find it but i often find sounds like this that i really like like cowbells and things like that and then i'll make two versions of this sound i'll make a major and a minor version of this same sound so this is how i made this lead here like uh, usually you couldn't just chop it up and make it fit because there's an interval built into the sample, but I'll usually put them into Melodyne and do this. Cool. I'll make two versions of it like so. It shows us our interval. So the root note is E major or E and our top interval note is that G sharp. So let's say I was in like E minor as a key. Um, Essentially, like, this sound isn't going to work if I put it over my root note because this note here, G-sharp, isn't in my key. So if I take this and put it down in a semitone, I get a um, minor version of this interval. So now I can use both of these. So I've got a major and a minor version that I can pitch around to fit any note that I have to fit. Does this need to be a specific version? Version? Yeah, it has to be Melodyne Studio. I'm pretty sure. Um, I think there's another free plugin out there that can do this, though. I'll try and hunt it down for you, Monsoons. I know you're in the Discord, so I'll try and hunt that down. I know that it's out there. Um, yeah, Studio. But I use this a ton. Like, the lead for the track that I made called Ghosted a long time ago, I did the same technique. I'll find sounds with intervals, print both of those versions. So like I would just freeze and flatten this. And this would be like my minor hit and this would be my major hit. And then depending on what note, bass note that I play over, uh, I can use either one if I need a major or minor third or whatever it is. Yo, thanks for chilling care. I appreciate you. But yeah, that's kind of like what I wanted to show you guys in this track. Everything else in this track is like simple um, for the most part, it's just a lot of auto pan to get all this movement. I struggle with like lead sound design stuff. So like that Melodyne thing helps me a ton. I do it with chords. Like I'll find a cool sample that's maybe not perfectly in the right key. Um, do you pan much in general? Um, yes no um i don't know i mean apparently no do i pan at all ever maybe not i don't think i ever pan <laughs> it's a little a little embarrassing maybe in my drums i pan my hi-hats to the right sometimes <laughs> yep there we go we got nine panning over here let's go um i haven't really mixed this track yet but um i generally work a lot with stereo field like with wideners and stuff um if i do pan it's thing it will be things like um dude did i pan nothing in this oh yeah i haven't panned anything in this yet which is maybe a little bit not great but the, the golden rule for me for panning is chronic non-panner too. Hell yeah. Um, if you do pan something to the right, your immediate thought 
should always be, what am I going to pan to the left to counter that? Um, oh, I panned these. They go back and forth. So I don't need to put something to the other side because this is hitting both. Um, what is this doing? Oh, yeah, okay. But yeah, um, I, I do pan a little bit at the end. Sometimes it depends on the track. Um, someone mentioned this kick. It's two laxity kicks and a click sound. Someone's asking about like the thumpiness of the kick. It's just those three layers. And then, yeah, that's nothing. Okay, yeah, that's that's just like the kick in this and the snare is, again, messy. I tried a bunch of different layers and one of them had this end on it. And instead of cleaning it up, I just kind of like left them all the extra tail sounds when I was just pulling in shorter sounds. I kind of liked it, so I just left it. But yeah, just like a lot of laxity drum sounds in this. And then uh, just like a little groove. Yeah, not nothing too crazy. A bunch of little fills and stuff to make it like filled out a bit I know six it seems it seems daunting but honestly you just gotta mess around until you get a cool idea going and then start thinking through your process like I wouldn't think about these things as you write them if that makes sense like think about these things later once you get an idea that you're starting to be happy with at first, man, like you should see my sessions when I start them. I'll pull on that mastering chain and I'll just have a mess of just stuff. And then once I start getting an idea, I'll start refining it. Um, to and, and thinking about these these sort of techniques. Um, my drums are almost always clipping before they hit my master. Yeah. Uh, kick. What are my drums doing here? Yeah. Yeah, my drums are pretty much always clipping. I always have my kick like around this level and my snare around this level too. Like just going a bit into the red with the peak. But yeah, I don't know if you guys don't have any other questions about this track. Um, if you guys want to do like a really quick Q&A, I know that we've, how long have we went for? Like two hours and a bit. I don't know how long they're supposed to be, but if you guys want to do just like a, a normal Q&A, talk about some, oh, do you know me click? clip and limit your drums before the master no i usually let my mastering chain solve that for me with this standard clip button. so this standard clip usually hits just the tops of my kicks and snares and then um just like i used that one knob brighter plugin earlier i use this api 560 to do the same thing um in in this but you could just use any eq it's just literally boosting 16k by like 3 db and then doing like is there anything else it's doing i think that might be it yeah 8k by like 2 db and 16k by 3 db just to get a bit more like shimmer and stuff but yeah if you guys do have production questions definitely like shoot and we'll try and hop into them otherwise if you guys want to do just like any questions about anything, you know, life, Minecraft, anything, just let me know. Hell yeah. Art within everything. Thank you for chilling. Hell yeah. 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 A underscore B O music. Yeah. Um, I can't open it because it crashes my sessions because I used to use it on 10. Oh, hell yeah. Demo. Let's hop into that. What's your Minecraft skin? It's an astronaut. Um, this is literally just like a saturator. If you have something like this, uh, fresh air from slate digital, which I think is really cheap or free. I can't remember. Um, this will, this will serve in that purpose. Just like a little bit of high air. It's all it's doing. Just a little bit of a saturator. But 
yeah, that's all it's doing. And then this is a little compressor, which isn't doing much. It's free. Hell yeah. Yeah, it's a really great plugin um, if you don't have like Aphex or this 560. Um, but you could do these with anything. You could even just take like Ableton Saturator. Um, like aim the bass a little bit higher and just pull down your dry wet to like, you know, 15%, something like that. Um, just to get a little bit of like a sizzle on there. Curious about your journey to Bitbird. Um, honestly, it happened pretty organically. I, I met up with like the Monster Cat guys years ago because we lived in Vancouver. Yo, thanks. My masters sound amazing. Um, I appreciate that. I sometimes get a little self-conscious of them, so I appreciate that. But yeah, I met up with the Man Monster Cat guys a long time ago because I lived in Vancouver and started putting up music through there. And at the same time, I think like... I mean, it may look different on Bitbird's end of how it came to be, but like what I understand of it is like I started becoming a bit, a bit closer with Hein and Vin of Drulu. And um, yeah, we were like chatting a bit and we both loved each other's music. And I think when I, I went on tour with them in like 2018, 2019 was when I really like kind of connected with the Bitbird um, crew a little bit more and started like, you know, sending them music and, and talking to them about doing potential releases. Um, it started, though, with remixes. I did a remix for Drulu and then a remix for Son. And those were, like, the first connections that I had with Bitbird in terms of, like, music stuff. But, yeah, I, I'd kind of been friends with a few of the people on the roster for a while before um, doing any musical stuff with Bitbird. But... Yeah, it just felt like a good fit. I love I love like every single one of the artists on Bitbird, so it felt like a good fit to put my music there cuz I I kept I kept feeling I was going in a very trappy direction and I was kind of pulled between the two. Um but I think with with Bitbird, they've definitely allowed me to be a bit more like experimental and like, you know, try out more styles if that makes sense. Yeah, the Broken Bricks remix. That was the first one. Um, that was, I think, my first ever, or maybe it was Love, Love Whip, which was like one of Son's tracks from album one. Um, that might have been my first one. One of those two, I can't remember. But yeah, dude, the Bitbird, the Bitbird crew has been unreal. I met up with a few of them um, in New York on the Drulu tour. And uh, yeah, they were all just great. How did you decide? Six, honestly, if you if you're like kind of just putting up music, I mean your music bangs already. I just want you to know. Um, I always say like at the start, wait, we could do this. Now we don't need to switch to just a face cam. But um if you are uh like curious of what kind of genre you should go for, um what I recommend is like try a few tracks of um, of different styles and different vibes and put them out and just see what the reaction is and see how you feel about them a little bit later. Because if you're kind of early in your releasing career, you get this really awesome period where you can put out a ton of music, see what hits, see what you feel good about a month down the road. And if you don't feel good about it, you can take it back um, and kind of just test the waters what feels good. Um, when you get a bit further in, you can't really do that as much. You don't have as much freedom to do that without, you know, having things like Getter happen where you, you know, try and switch your genre a bit and, and your fan base feels alienated. Um, so, yeah, I think just try a bunch of stuff at the start and see what feels best. Um, the other thing, too, is don't worry too much about genres. Um, ultimately, what's going to work for you is your mixing decisions and your sound choices those are going to be somewhat consistent um, throughout all your tracks. Like I make a bunch of different genres and they all still kind of sound like Tails tracks because I have a certain perception of what I like in snares and in sound design and in the volume of certain things. It all kind of like ties into each other. Have you ever developed bad habits with production? Yeah, I mean, I think my my biggest bad habit is... I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have it is, is just being down on stuff. Like, um, 
Yeah. Okay. Those are both great questions. Um, and not really finishing music. I think, man, this maybe sounds a little counterintuitive and like might be out of pocket, but to be honest, man, like sometimes like stop getting advice from your homies, stop showing your music to your friends. (laughs) Um, and, and, and family and, and stuff. Like I find often like I share, I was, I was sharing my music too early and I'd be hella proud of it and it wouldn't really get the response I was looking for. Um, and it would really kind of crush me sometimes and be like, damn, like it feels like, like the people I'm really excited to share this thing with aren't super hyped. And it's like, dude, it's fair. It's like half baked ideas that I'm sending them that I just think are cool. Um, and sometimes I just felt like, you know, you'd be getting feedback on things that weren't quite done and, and it would just like suck. (laughs) So a big thing for me to start finishing music was just to not send it to anybody anymore. And, and, and it's done when I think it's done. And that helped me a lot, like a lot, a lot. Um, unless you've got a friend that's like super supportive and gasses you up. Like when you share your musical ideas with somebody, when they're in an early stage, what you really want to hear most times is this is fire. Keep going with it. Like you're not usually looking for like that harsh feedback. So I try and preface, like if things aren't ready for feedback, I'll just say, please listen to this. It's not ready for feedback. I just want like you to hear it. Like, for example, the other thing I do is I I've got another project, um, that I have been working on that has been very, very helpful because it lets me get out my ideas and maybe I'll I'll leak some of it later, but maybe not. Um, yeah, yeah. Sharing with friends and family specifically is kind of hard sometimes. Um, Damon had a good question too. Is it a point you can knew you could do this full time? Yes, and I overshot it big time. Um, I quit my job and stuff too early, and like went on tour and lost a good bit of money <laughs> and like was financially hurting, but it has made me creative in the ways that I like make income. Like, I don't know. There's a, if you're interested, Damon, I did a big breakdown of this on my stream a while ago, talking about just like the financials of being an artist and how it works. Um, I can definitely like try and link it to you. Um, if you're in the discord, but yeah, I jumped off a bit too early. I got a bit too ambitious um and then like covid hit and i was like damn yeah i didn't prepare for this but um i would say like if you guys are curious about like how to make a living with it my biggest advice always is to diversify where you get your income streams or yeah get your income get that in a bunch of different places like streaming shows um selling beats publishing all that sort of stuff because it helps a ton hell yeah high wind yeah we'll see you in there santiago beats let's go um there's another good one up here too have you ever felt yeah yasi yeah 100 percent. um i don't know if you guys will be able to hear this let me just turn this on then you might be able to um I, i've like messed with the idea wait which one's which um yeah so like i'll say this first actually i make a ton of hip-hop beats on the side and i also like have been starting this project where i do like a little bit of vocal stuff and like it's a very different vibe so it's like this much more raw a little bit more like instrument based
so I've been making a ton of stuff like this. Um, where's like, yeah, like this sort of vibe. A little bit more, not tailsy though, you know? This sort of thing. This is my favorite one, I think. So like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I, I've had a ton of things in the past that I've made just to get it kind of like off my chest because sometimes I want that stuff to like be made, but it doesn't fit with the tails thing. So I'll just make it just for fun. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know where that stuff will fit. Um, I, I want to release them, but I don't really know how. Yeah, maybe a second artist project, something like that. But I think it's important to like not stop yourself making the stuff you want to make if it doesn't fit into the project that you kind of are main like the tails project that's okay just make it um and like realize that like you sitting there working on the same project every day trying to force yourself to make songs for you know the tails project or whatever um if you if you allow yourself to just be creative and make whatever you want eventually you're going to kind of have those like tails tracks be made and, and started. If you really like kind of pigeonhole yourself at the start being like, I need to make an EDM banger drop all this sort of stuff. Um, generally your writing process is going to be way slower and way more miserable. Um, but if you just make fun stuff eventually, or well, not even fun, it doesn't have to be fun, but sad stuff, crazy stuff, whatever. Eventually, if you just let it flow, you'll make the stuff that uh, fits into each different project or whatever you like. Yeah, tails type beat. Do you start your tracks with a plan or you just go with it? I just go with it. Um, I usually grab like a vocal part or like I've recently like had my guitar plugged in at all times and I'll just grab that. I did mean to show you guys, um, if you're using Splice for everything and you're a little bit sick of it, uh, I would recommend checking out this website called Noise. Um, I use Noise a lot for this sort of thing. Like... Like a lot of just like cool atmospheric sounds and like a bunch of just like cool tapey grainy sounds and like and I try to keep uh where is it um oh man I don't think I'd be able to find it oh yeah warm hands this is like the vocal from photos of the sun. which I love pressed against mine felt so warm and right um I try and find a lot of stuff on this website noise cuz it's a little bit less picked over than splice and it's n o i i z um where is it where is it noise n o i i z it's really dope um and it has fair vocal the holy p honestly it's such a nice vocal i love it um and it has all the sample phonics packs on it, which are like, yeah, the Muramasa and the Flume sauce. They're all on there. So it's a it's a good alternative to Splice, although the interface is way, way worse. But yeah, we're hitting the two hour and a half mark. And I think that we should probably wrap it up. Um, but I really appreciate you guys chilling. And um yeah, it's been super fun. I feel like I tangented a lot, but I saw a lot of people in the chat saying that they learned some stuff. So that makes me happy. Um, Epic Spencer moment. Hell yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I stream pretty much usually three times a week. So if you guys want to pop over to my Twitch channel at any point, it's just Tales X Beats. And we'll catch you guys there, hopefully. Um, I'm going to flip it over to an end screen that has the rest of the uh, the stream schedule for Bitbird and put on some tunes and hell yeah.
I appreciate you guys chilling. Thank you so much. Thank you.